It's showtime, folks. Enjoy the show. A fine Saturday matinee to you, Steve Sarmento. Good morning. Doing okay? You feeling good? You know, it's it's a nice sunny day. The sky is clear blue. Uh, I got the windows open. It's it's really nice. So, but my technology is wonky this morning. So it's throwing me off. It's throwing me off. My technology is fine, but it's really, you know, really cold this morning here. <laughs> I'm not crazy about the season change. It happens fast. Well, you know, you choose to live there, so you've got no one to blame but yourself. That's okay. <laughs> fall is fall offers me my greatest color palette in in terms of you know my sweatshirts and hemp <laughs> pants. I, I I really fit in fall here. In okay, Portland, that's so, <laughs> so I could take it. Oh, you're, okay. You're a, you're a fall. Yeah person okay i'm a fall okay (laughs) i'm definitely an autumn okay you're an autumn Um, it goes well with my beard (laughs) (laughs) that's true that is true uh Uh, speaking of things to to see so this it's it's interesting that you you ask because it's mm -hmm. one of these weekends where it seems like things are converging because i was i was checking out the reviews and i see that ben lott posted this like half star review of rocky horror picture show and what makes that interesting oh. what makes that interesting is that uh i had been talking with a couple of friends and so these are these are men that are like my age that have never seen the rocky horror picture show ever uh-huh. so i decided i that that cannot stand they need to see this However, the there's only like one theater that does the like midnight screenings with the audience participation. And I went maybe two years ago and was not impressed with the group that was doing this. So they weren't doing it right. They, it just part of it is for me, the audience participation is to enhance the movie, not just bombard the audience with, you know, lines every other word. It was just way too much. And a lot of them weren't funny. I'm like, you guys are just trying mm-hmm. too hard. It wasn't the way I remembered it. So my wife and I are sitting down. We found a couple different versions online. Plus I was a big fan of the audience participation album that was recorded. I don't know when in the late seventies or something. So that's where a lot of the lines that I knew growing up came from. So we're basically constructing our own audience participation script so that we can have our friends over and we can recreate that for them to the best of our ability because for me if you just go and I, when this came out on video i was in college and i thought oh why would you do this people are going to go to blockbuster and rent this movie and watch this and say what the heck this what why, mm-hmm. why is this a thing it's the experience so i'm trying to we're trying to get things ready to you know next week or the week after have this event in our house to create this yeah. experience for them now, no, I just I, I have to ask. So you're going to create this in your in in your house with people who have never seen the movie. It's going to be you and your wife doing all the audience participation <laughs> stuff. Is that weird? Well, it's, it's, Is it it's, just pretty much you and your wife enjoy the movie and everybody else watching you be weird? <laughs> well, yeah. Not not that I'm down on your plan at all, but that seems like well, that seems like a, a reach. Well, well, here's the thing. Okay, so the the Harkin Theater here, they do five dollar Tuesdays, and they show like classic films. You get a chance to see them on the big screen. A couple of years ago, uh-huh. uh, they did Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That was great. Uh, like Emma, my daughter wanted to go. We she got dressed up. We got some fake coconuts and you know a little like some fake greenery so they could have shrubbery you know started doing that thing so they their rocky horror picture show was just maybe two weeks ago i think it was the first one in october so my i i had something i could not go uh so my wife went with a friend of hers and they sat down and you know you know, it's the show starting one of the staff comes out and says hey you know it's you know they always introduce the movie and said you know Please, you know, don't throw things at the screen and please be respectful of those around you, which apparently many people in the audience took to mean don't shout out the lines really loud. So there were small clusters of people sort of just snickering and and muttering to each other, which (laughs) like whispering at the movie. Yes, exactly. Which (laughs) no, 
no, no, no. So <laughs> we're we're gonna, you know, well, Kimberly and I are working on the lines. Emma may participate as well, so there may be more of them, you know. Okay. So we're we're All gonna right. try to be. To me, that when I went and saw it in high school, I had no idea what I was walking into, and it just makes that experience. And so much of the when you get the good lines, it it just it makes some great jokes. It just enhances the experience of the movie. And I can't let these two men go through their lives without seeing the movie. And I, I definitely cannot let them experience it as Ben did, which is let me just sit down and watch this as a movie. I mean, for, <clears throat> for me, watching Rocky Horror Picture Show alone in your house is like going to the bathroom amongst a crowd of crazy people that are yelling and screaming at you. That's not the way it's supposed yeah. to work. It's flipped. Yeah. You're supposed to go to the bathroom by yourself in the privacy of your own home. You're supposed to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show amongst a group of crazy <laughs> strangers screaming at you. If you do it the ba- if you do it the other way, that's just insanity, and it's going to be awkward well, and comfortable yeah. and a very scarring experience for you. It, it's one of those where the film has become a transcendent cultural experience, and and the the, the cultural part is actually equal parts, if not larger, than the experience of watching the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's exactly. that's important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I absolutely agree. And I applaud you and your wife for taking this on. I mean, if to indoctrinate people the right way, <laughs> if you have a program like this, I feel like there is going to be a way to reproduce it. I think you can help. It's like the Rocky Horror Indoctrination Home Indoctrination Kit. <laughs> well, the Rocky Horror Home Indoctrination Kit. I think this is perfect. There, there we go. I, well, if Andy's available, I may have it's to like get how him. to host a murder. Yes. But it's oh, how to watch a movie. How to, how to yeah. watch Rocky. I, now, if Andy's in town ta- in, in town and available i may have to get him over just because i agree you need a critical mass if it was just me they, they, if it's you, you and three people <laughs> who have never seen it then it's weird you're the one who's weird right. in this case you, you need to outnumber them so i figured if we get three to four <laughs> to outnumber the two then we can we can we can do this possibly uh, I'll, I'll have to provide an update after this happens to let you know how i, I am plan. eager eager to hear how this turns out Oh my, Steve. Well, I I do have a question uh for you. Um and uh I hope that you can uh y- you can lead me down the the road here. Uh, the the question is are you wearing a mask right now? <laughs> I'm not wearing a mask right now. What well, wait. was that all about? Okay. So, had you read that Twitter thread before? No, you were not aware no, of this. To- it's to- no. totally new to this. And I was deeply moved. <laughs> it, you know what it does? OK, I'm going to let you introduce it. But let me just say, I read this thing and I realized that as long as I have been a member of Twitter, which is a long time, I now know I've been doing it wrong. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so what is it that, that I am so excited about? <laughs> so you were excited. And this it well. I, I don't know how I found out about this when it, it first happened, but occasionally there will be some these epic posts that, that appear on Twitter. And there was uh, another one that I recall just a couple months ago where I think a, a comedy writer had basically trolled Twitter. And if you went back through her Twitter feed, you could see that the first word of every tweet, she basically had done Bohemian Rhapsody with the first word of every tweet over a period of like a year and a half. Uh, okay, but the, yeah, I do. I recall that. So this is sort of epic in yeah. that scale. And th- this is from from last July, and it's uh, just a Twitter conversation between two writers, and just starts with, you know, yo, can you help me out? Hey, what do you need? Well, I don't know if I told you, but I recently became a cam cam counselor. Well, that's cool. It was going super well, but there's some kind of crazy serial killer, and the conversation just continues between Sam Sykes and Chuck Wendig, and. It you know it I think the critical point is when Chuck asks Sam you know hey are you sure you're not the killer and then things sort of go off the rails it reminds me a lot of Scream they play around with the tropes of sort of the slasher genre but the real insanity is that this became a movie yeah you know Twitter there there have been many attempts to take things from Twitter and turn them into other properties. Uh, there was the William Shatner TV show stuff. My dad says, but it was, uh, I guess yeah. I, I, it's Saturday morning. I can say shit. My dad says on here. Can't I? I don't <laughs> so know. We're doing yes. Right. Yes. Uh, and yeah. which, which tank this one it looks like they did it right. 
You know, I think they've got a great cast in this. Uh, you, the, the fact that Fran Kranz is in this yes, with Allison Hannigan. Yes, are you kidding? Exactly. It's perfect. Yes. It's perfect. So it's, yeah, I didn't know this was happening. I just thought, oh, it's a clever little Twitter. You know, I, I don't know. How, part of me wonders if there was a little, you know, pre-conversation and planning between these two guys, which, yeah. you know, is possible. Don't don't think about but it. Don't other, think about it. You otherwise, think I think it, yeah. it's just two, two really sharp-minded guys that just sort of had a great afternoon on Twitter you know, back and forth with each other. Uh, and it's it's hysterical to just watch this thing play out. It's like, I'm hoping this is like some of the greatest improv ever because it just works so well. That's what yeah. that's what I need it to be. Yes. I need to not know anything else. Yes, exactly. Other than, yeah. you know, <laughs> what kind of mask are you wearing? Oh, a wooden mask <laughs> whose empty eyes drink in the light and whose jagged grin suggests it was carved, forced upon it when it didn't laugh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's creepy. <laughs> that's not even a job or anything. That's just I mean, you found an evil mask and you put it on. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> All right, I could appreciate that, but I came for advice, not judgment. I mean, this is the best way. <laughs> yes. uh, okay, so hey, I googled all this stuff and it looks a whole lot like you are the killer. So, plus for you. <laughs> that's right. You don't have to worry about dying because, you know, you're you're just the killer. So so what does one typically do in these situations? Well, you can probably feel thrilled to just kill more people. But, you know, there is bad news. You're going to get killed by the last person you choose to kill. So, yeah. <laughs> what if I leave? So what you're saying is if I leave two guys, I'm okay. Yes. Yeah, the math checks out. Yes. Uh. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, this was this was a great way to wake up this morning. We'll put the link in the show notes. It's a great thread uh, all the way through, and uh, so there you go. And I I now can't wait to see the movie. Yes, but that's not my trailer. Pick. That is not my trailer. I know pick. that's a that's well, like a hey, it's a bonus what, because what a delightful segue you just offered. <laughs> I'm sharp this morning. Would would we like to talk about trailers, Steve? I think we can talk about trailers. We don't have right. any red band trailers. We don't. We don't. No, we, this is. We're, no, the, we're, we're, we're like, we hit like peak red band A24 and it's like, now we got nothing. It's almost like A24 went out of business. <laughs> like, we're not giving you they guys made any... all the movies. <laughs> and, and then they saw what we were doing and decided that was wrong. <laughs> all right, everybody. You're all accountants again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Back to work. All right. Okay. Well, I think what's your trailer? Well, I think we. I think your trailer just builds right off of what we were talking about, though. You're, you're, oh, you think I should go? First I think you should. I saying. think you should go first. It's in the same same genre. Okay. There, sort of a right. little gross thing well, with blood I, and I, gore, I, right? I have to start then uh, with a trip back in time to a movie I have talked about a number of times on uh, this show, though we have never done this movie as a subject uh, piece to the next reel it is 1997's cube oh i'm so the, i'm so glad you're you're there okay great okay yes. this is this is one of my very favorite movies and that might be weird because i don't generally like horror movies i enjoy cube a lot for some weird reason right strangers six complete strangers are dropped into this giant metal box and it's uh, actually a collection of boxes and they have to crawl through the boxes in some boxes there are laser fields and <laughs> flamethrowers and some boxes there aren't and they have to find their way out this movie uh, not just edges above the six star rule on imdb cube is a 7.3 that yes. handily yeah. clears the six star rule at imdb this is not a bad movie oh no and so no right so i with that introduction i bring you 2019's Escape Room. Six complete strangers find themselves in circumstances beyond their control and must use their wits to survive. They are they all answer the call, this mysterious call to uh, see if they can get out of an escape room and it turns out the escape room is actually a horror show and it's out to kill them. Uh it is a film uh, directed by Adam Robitel. Uh it was written uh, by uh, uh Bragi Shut and Maria Melnick, and uh, it stars uh, some other folks that I don't know very well. Tyler Labine, uh, Deborah Ann Wall, Taylor Russell, Nick Dodani, uh, Logan Miller is in it. Uh, and uh, these folks, have to, they, they are solving the puzzles of the escape room. The one we see 
one we see, which might be a bit on the nose uh, in, in the beginning, is uh, the, the first room, I guess, that they're in is actually a giant oven. And once they realize <laughs> that the clue is they have to turn the oven to Fahrenheit 451, uh, they're able to escape before the flames actually charbroil them. Yes. I, I th- Apparently, according to IMDb, no one has seen this movie yet. Oh. And so there is no star rating. And that's why I bring up Cube, because I'm holding high hopes that Cube is the precedent and that once people see Escape Room, they will have as much fun as they did with Cube, and that it will uh, it, it will go ahead and ignite the passion uh, for fun uh, locked room horror mystery, horror stories. I found myself uh, enamored by this little film, and I hope that you did as well. I am so glad you mentioned Cube because it's the first thing that came to mind. It's just I I love that movie so much because it's great character piece i mean you you it was low budget you just you put you you build a big square room and you light it differently and have people crawl into it different ways and you suddenly you know created this massive huge cube that's a big puzzle and rooms move around but it's about the relationships and the characters and the the stress of being in these life-threatening situations and how these different character types react to that and as we learn more about them because they in cube they just wake up in the room here, yes. here, here we get six yeah. different people that have been selected for some reason, which in Cube, they, clearly they were somehow abducted and placed there. These are people that received mm-hmm. a mysterious package that basically, hey, you can win a million dollars if you are the first one to escape from our escape room. I love the concept of taking, you know, sort of the popular trend right now of these different escape rooms and twisting it into this nasty horror show. Uh, I think it's going to bring people in. I just hope they're able to carry through on the character piece as well of how these different character types are going to what their strengths are what their backgrounds are and how that's going to work to really keep us engaged and interested in them as they work their way through just a crazy number of weird holographic rooms because at one point they're like outside in the tundra uh, they're in, right. they're in an, falling through ice. Yes, they're in an upside down room. I I love the visuals on this. I just hope that the writing you know gives us some compelling characters to take this journey with because I am all on board for a movie like this. And w- what's the deal with the poster? Like the teaser poster is uh, Taylor Russell's character. It's close up, and her face is puzzle pieces, and underneath the puzzle pieces are. Uh, is her skeleton and uh, what what are we trying to learn from that like i i find it uh I, I found it really fun and i hope that they're able to lean in both as you say on the character stuff but really lean in on the the puzzles and make them make sense and not just you know um, not just dumb luck that they just happen to right. stumble on all of yes. these ridiculous I, I like puzzles, yeah actually. i like some clever problem solving as, yeah as part clever of the, problem solving yes exactly that's right. Uh, the movie has been plagued by uh, uh, release uh, scheduling issues. I don't know if they're working the counter programming thing. It was supposed to come out uh, m- much earlier this year. Uh, it, it was kicked to February of 2019 and then reined in a little bit. And now it's in possibly the worst <laughs> release window uh, of all for the U.S. at least January 4th, mm. 2019. Uh, so that doesn't bode well. But it was originally scheduled to rele- for release in a much better window. So I'm going to pretend that that's the day that it is when I see this movie. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, maybe that means that everybody will have had more faith in it in this alternate reality yes. uh, escape room of my own mind. So January 4th in the U.S., Russia gets it on the 31st, Bulgaria, the U.K. on February 1st, uh, Netherlands, you can see it February 28th, and Sweden. Uh, hello, Sweden, March 1st, 2019. So there you go. That's mine. Escape room. Yeah, right. uh, and that, that was me counter-programming against you. But now I think because you're going second, you are counter-programming against me. <laughs> okay. With your trailer this morning. Well, it, it is sort of counter-programming because it's coming out on like the date that everybody goes to see movies, Christmas Day. So Mm -hmm. as opposed to being dumped into the, you know, depths of of January, this is, you know, being programmed to we this this is when you're sick and fed up with your family and you're in a turkey coma, you want to go out and see a movie here, go go see something like this. 
like this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think what it's it's the cast. I looked at this cast and I said, "Oh yeah, this will draw people in because you you have your you know Bradley Whitford, your Scoot McNary, your Sebastian Stan. For your fans of uh, you know movies about Canadian clones, you've got your Tatiana Maslany, you have Nicole Kidman, all together in this crazy movie called." Destroyer, a story about a police detective who in the past had an undercover assignment and now later on she's sort of revisiting this. So it looks like a story told in flashbacks, but the transformation of Nicole Kidman in this is just amazing. I not it, It's Oscar, you know, physical transformation type of, of stuff. You, you will not recognize her. What really got me excited about this is it's... Uh, director karen kusama who had i had started off with movies like girl fight and then Aeon flux sort of dropped off for me she really came back strong with uh the invitation a couple of years ago which is mm-hmm. probably not your type of film but was a no. really really solid film and just knocked my socks off so she's coming back with this uh writers phil hay and matt manfredi who are a writing team that uh, put this one together and they have sort of a mixed uh, filmography with things like Ride Along, Ride Along 2, Ride Along 3, The Tuxedo, Clash of the Titans. I don't know where this thing is coming from because it's like they it's like this project that had been simmering and stewing someplace else because it's just such a heavy, dark drama getting into, you know, undercover cop violence and uh, just really dark material that doesn't look like anything they've written before so i'm really <clears throat> i'm really excited and interested to see how all this comes together some a script that's going to attract this cast i know has got to have some quality to it so that's yeah that's what i'm i'm hoping for and with this release date i think that uh we're gonna have a uh, strong oscar oscar contender here yeah, totally. I, you know, I, I, I feel like this has, and, and this is not just the transformation of our principal character, but uh, the fact that this has such a strong vibe of, you know, memento and monster and monsters ball. I mean, you, yeah, in, in fact, you should just make monster and destroyer a double feature. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> just get, just beat yourself up. Uh, that's, that's kind of what it feels like. And, and, uh, so I, I love, uh, the lengths to which Nicole Kidman clearly, uh, went for this character. I think it's, it, it's obviously that's the, that's what makes it one to, to watch. Now, can the movie live up to, uh, that transformation? Here's hoping. Yeah. Uh, Christmas Day. Uh, it premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, but I think that Christmas Day tells you everything you need to know about this one to put it on your list of things to see. As I said, I'm I'm trying to get out to anticipate what the best picture, you know, Oscar noms are going to be, and make sure I get out to see a good chunk of them ahead of time, so I'm not having mm-hmm. to. You know, we like to catch up. catch up. I think Andy's still catching up from last year. And that's just uh, I, I really hate being in that position of trying to catch up afterwards. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think this is a strong one. Look, really looking forward to it. And another delightful segue. Yes. For you. Steve. Oh, my God. You are two for two <laughs> in fantastic segues from Destroyer to our list this week. What did you like better? Jedi or the Empire Strikes Back? Empire. Last for me. Empire had the better ending. I mean, Luke gets his hand cut off, finds out Vader's his father, uh, hand gets frozen, take away by Boba Fett. It ends on such a down note. I mean, that's what life is, a series of down endings. All, all Jedi had was a bunch of Muppets. I think they were kind to us. We don't need to, you know, exert our authoritarian influence over our voters that's on right. this one because it, uh, this was, they... They gave us a lot of room to to run with this one, so I'm I'm finished. They sure did. We were gonna we uh, the options were space diseases, parasite in movies, <laughs> yes. and unhappy endings, and they went with unhappy endings for us. And uh, you know what? It turns out um, uh, filmmakers tend to like unhappy endings, and so uh, there we go. There are a lot to choose from. Well, and, and maybe maybe from. that's their plan is they're gonna then just beat us up with how could you have not mentioned this? How could you have exactly. forgot this one? Because oh, I think I mean that's it. Andy already pulled that on us last week. I can't believe you didn't say. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the worst. So yeah. here we go. I, I'll tell you, the ones I went with, these are the this list, and it's uh, I've got some backups, too. Uh, okay. Because I actually, believe it or not, I have a feeling I've got a steal in here. Uh, All right. And uh, so uh, I actually have some backups. Um, but these are the... the uh, the ones that came to me are are the movies that had that visceral impact the that made me rethink the film or my relationship with the film uh and uh and and that I still think about today right now, you know in, in these cases these movies are are quite old these are not what i think are maybe as the best unhappy endings but they're the ones that that are the most lasting for me personally. Okay. So that's how I get over it. Okay, that's that's sort of the approach I took as well. There's the okay. yeah, this, these are ones where because there's a lot of movies with like oh that's a sad ending, oh that's a real depressing ending, but ones that just really yeah sort of punch yeah. you in the gut and you're like oh yeah yeah okay yeah all right. So um, uh, I went first on the trailer, Steve. I think you should go first on this. Okay, I I will right. start. This is this is just going to get worse and worse and. <laughs> I need some therapy after getting through this. I know, right? Just thinking about <laughs> some of these again. Uh, I'm going to start us off in the mid-90s. And when things are uh, just out of college, I was finishing up grad school and had heard about this this movie. You know, it's set in the 90s. We've got a movie about teenagers. Uh, this is, I think, the first film written by Harmony Corinne. This was where, I think... We have a couple young actors whose career started uh, and Larry Clark's really depressing movie, Kids, which for me was really, I think the strength from this movie comes from and just almost the documentary style approach to this. Casting a bunch of unknowns looks like, you know, just grabbing kids off the street and telling the story of a, a kid who's on a mission to basically deflower as many virgins as he can and one of his conquests finds out she's HIV positive so then you've got this you know dilemma of here's a kid whose mission is to go out and have sex with as many people and she knows he's HIV positive so you know, you've got to stop him but it's it's a group of outcast street kids yeah, this is this is what I've I've seen it once. I don't ever want to see it again. I think it does such a great job of communicating its message. I think the I I just this is where I, I start. I, I think I'm going downhill from here. Uh, oh. But uh, this is uh, Rosario Dawson. You know, first appears here. Uh, Chloe Sevigny is in here. So recognizable faces. If you haven't seen this before. Uh, interesting to see where they got their start, but just warning this, this one is uh, it's a quote, Tommy. Oh, it's just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is the worst. Yes. It's a great pick. And yeah. what a downer way to start yes. this list. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, my, my first one is, is uh, I'll say a little bit lighter, but uh, again, it's the one I remember. I saw this movie in, it, it was not an 80s movie, but I saw it in the 80s. I was a kid and um, I uh, was impacted. It's a movie from 1978 and uh, it is by oh, the end, the end of the movie when our protagonist is walking down the street and our, uh, the female lead walks up to him. And she thinks she's found salvation and he stretches out his arm mm. and gives the shriek mm. of the body snatchers. Mm -hmm. That's right. Donald Sutherland as uh, Matthew Bennell in 1978's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That, that's the first time I remember being completely floored at what they would do to our hero in a movie and completely turn the tails uh, on, on me uh, as an audience member. And I thought, this is amazing, and I hate entertainment. <laughs> uh, and, and so that was, that was a big one. The cast was fantastic. I mean, Jeff Goldblum and Leonard Nimoy and Veronica Cartwright. Obviously, it was Veronica Cartwright in that particular sequence. I mean, it's just a, uh, a wonderful film, a wonderful remake in, in part of a, I mean, Body Snatchers was part of its own kind of, um, you know, entertainment industrial complex. I mean, yes. Heinlein did yeah. a did a story on it. It had been remade already from the earlier film. It's it's one that's been it's a well that has been well tapped. Uh, so but but the first one that I saw or read or did anything about was um, was 1978. And so that's the one that sticks with me. Oh, that's the that's the intense one, because th there, there's the shriek at the end. And then there's also 
I want to say the part where they they find the pods that uh, yeah, and they're they're destroyed and they're ones that that and then the dog the dog with the guy's face on it. Oh God, I know. Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is a disturbing movie. Thanks. Thanks it was a, a very lot. disturbing yeah. movie. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> What'd we say? All down here. For yes, us from exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right, what's your number two? My number two is a musical. Really? I am a huge fan of Bjork. And so when she was cast in a uh, movie... Lars von Trier. Trier. Yes, because uh. I, I'm a huge fan of Bjork and Catherine Deneuve and David Morse and just... <laughs> I. Yes, I. She doesn't even finish the last song. It's such a downer. <laughs> it's it works so well, and I yeah, Lars von Trier. There's, I've seen a few. There's sometimes yes, I, he's pretentious and full of himself and all of that. But he's there are some of his movies that I've seen that I've really, really enjoyed, and this was one that I had a great time with. I just don't ever want to watch it again, and I think. <laughs> I saw this on video. It was a couple of years later. So I think maybe, I don't know. I think both the kids were born maybe by this time. So yeah, being a parent and watching this is like, makes it a thousand times worse because of this. This is her, uh, what a mother will do for her, for her son. Uh, but I, I love the soundtrack. There are so many great songs on here. The musical number. I mean, when you have that's, he taps into the power of a good musical, which is that ultimate escapism. Your life can be just horrible, but you know, musicals give you that ability to escape and the, you know, working in the factories and where she just in her imagination transforms everything into these musical numbers works so well that the, the clanking of the machinery just becomes the beat of the song. I, I love those segments, everything else. Oh, good Lord. The humanity is just <laughs> oh my gosh uh if you haven't seen it yes go check it out you'll you'll if you particularly if you like musicals then just don't write me and tell me how much you hate me for making you watch this because <laughs> you will hate Steve. yes oh yeah oh, yes you will so there we are oh, yeah that's the worst <laughs> doesn't even finish the song such a down yep. okay uh, so w- my number two pick, when I say Milos Forman, Steve, which Milos Forman film could I possibly be talking about? Uh, he has uh, oh, he's my gosh. Got a couple. Yeah, he does. He's got a couple. Yeah. But there's one. There's one that stuck with me like nothing else. Are you still in the, uh, are you in, are you in the 70s still, Pete? Are you still in the 70s? <sighs> Steve, I'm, I am in the 70s okay. and I'm in Oregon. <laughs> Okay. Therefore, and this this is the one I had to do yeah. to bring it home, yeah. to uh, bring it back to my own house. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the the end when the chief sees that yeah. his buddy McMurphy actually had the lobotomy yeah. and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, and, and and chief takes things and pillows into his own hand yeah. and uh, ends it for us. But you know, he gets away. Yeah. So there's something that turns out. <laughs> This whole movie was the chief's escape plan all along. And if you watch it like that, <laughs> this is a this is a really uplifting movie. And oh. and McMurphy is just uh, just another cog in the wheel. If you liked McMurphy at all, let's just say don't get stuck. Uh, uh, d- don't build any sort of emotional relationship with with our man McMurphy. Oh. Because, woof, it's a downer. Uh, yeah. Oh. That sweet, sweet release of, of death. And one flew over the cuckoo's nest directed by Milos Forman based on the book that uh, uh, by Ken Kesey. Uh, yes. Right? Yeah. Is that a Ken Kesey book? Yep. And um, I haven't read it. Never read it. I haven't read it either. Actually, it's because I saw the movie. And you, I never read and you it. Said, Why did I do that? Yes, exactly. Well, the, I think the thing that I do know is the book is written from the chief's point of view. So that's the one thing. I know. So, so in, it with really the, is the chief's chief story. <laughs> yes. But there's so, oh right. my gosh, but there are so many faces in this, yeah. uh, so many familiar faces, such a great cast. This was Christopher Lloyd's uh, film debut in this, yeah. this movie. Uh, Brad Dourif, uh, Will Sampson, uh, Louise Fletcher, of course, Nurse Ratched. Uh, this was a terrific film, and uh, it's got a tough, tough ending. Real downer. Can't believe, sort of can't believe we haven't talked about it on the show yet. But you know, there's lots of movies. So. There are lots of movies. That, this is def- oh, this won so many awards. Uh, Michael Douglas was a producer on this. So many. Oh, it's it's one of those those classics. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. 
All right. All right. There you go. Okay. What's your number two? Number two. So I'm going way back in time at this one. Uh, well, relative to the other films I've been talking about. And so I guess I didn't want to end on such a, a down, down ending. So this one isn't like, oh, 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 Lord, please. <laughs> Please take me now because I it can't get any worse. Um, <laughs> but it's one that I think, given the tone of the film, it's it really is a surprise. And it, it captures, I think, for, for that generation that it was speaking to, that particular moment in time really well, or, or just their generation. But for me, watching this later, you know, seeing this, it still really spoke to me. I think, uh, you know, it's such, it's one that I, I, I connect with as a man. I, am a, I want to share it with my, my daughters as they get older, but I don't think it's going to, it's going to work for them because now the movie's like 50 years old and it's about a guy who is, you know, sort of drifting through life after graduating and having an affair with an older woman, but that moment on the bus with Dustin Hoffman uh, at the end and the sounds of silence come on. And after everything he's done of this, that, that moment of silence on the bus of like, now what happens now? What do we do? Is mm. sort of that. There's so many great comic moments in this movie. And now it's like, Oh crap. What have I done? What do we do? Where are our lives going? I don't know. Uh, really surprised me. And, it's a film that I haven't seen in a long time, but it's one again that really struck me of you're rooting for this guy to get the girl and, you know, he breaks up the wedding and it's like, yes, they're going to run off happily into the sunset. Oh no, they're not. <laughs> I'm just going to sit yeah. there in silence. And it, it really blew me away of making that decision to say, you know, just camera on them. Simon and Garfunkel comes on and it's like, yeah, this is not the tone I was expecting to have at the end of this movie. So I think that's I don't know what's more telling about that. That that for you is a it, that that represents a downer ending. Yes. In the degree yes. of your first pick. <laughs> like what? I had, I, had, I had to lighten it up a little. I had to. But I think there's to be there's I guess maybe it's a more psychological downer. It's not an emotional downer. It's like mm -hmm. it, it's an anxiety driven downer, I guess. Is the way I think of that. All right, all right. I can I can feel that. I can feel that. Uh, interesting, interesting pick. Uh, and and I hope that uh, it is it is actually I would say not in the character of my final pick, okay. <laughs> which which is which maybe it would be if their bus had blown up at the end. That would have <laughs> okay. that would have actually okay. it would have met the standard for my final pick. I'm I'm in nineteen ninety nine, Steve. Do you have any picks from nineteen ninety nine? No, I do not. I don't think I do. Oh dear. I am talking about uh, 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 Jeff Bridges' film. Jeff Bridges and Tim Robbins. Uh, oh, were, yeah. Uh, they were in a movie together. Yeah. Sure were. Right up until the very last scene. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is the 1999 film Arlington Road from director Mark Pellington and uh, uh, written by Aaron Kruger. Uh, it is the story of uh, an obsessive uh, professor teaching a story or teaching a class on uh, terrorism. And he becomes obsessed and believes that his new neighbors, uh, uh, Tim Robbins and, and Joan Cusack, uh, actually are terrorists. And he starts going nuts and unraveling this whole thing uh, and trying to build a case against his neighbors. And so you get this whole uh, like this whole arc of fierce suburbia. Right. You already are terrified of suburbia when you learn that, in fact, yes, they, they are terrorists. And there is this crazy uh, plot to blow stuff up and the twist at the end when Jeff Bridges actually is tricked into driving uh, uh, the yeah. bomb laden car and blowing up the the FBI building himself, killing himself and hundreds of people, uh, you know, is the it's it's the ultimate twist in this movie. It is subversive and super dark. And, um, you know, the, the fact that it's just this is just a movie of layers and layers of cultural fear that we have indoctrinated ourselves uh, with is I, I thought was was really particularly um, stunning 
at the end. The music is fantastic. Angela Baldamenti does the music in this thing, and and um, uh, big fan of, of Baldamenti's work. So I this this was a pretty uh, uh, impactful movie in terms of downer endings. And uh, Bridges plays <laughs> plays a sweaty nutso, just like he does <laughs> everywhere to an absolute T. Oh, this this is a movie that is very much of its era and we're in you know yes pre 9 11 when we were dealing with a lot more sort of internal terrorism we had you know oklahoma city we had you know fbi oh, stuff waco, waco. Right? yes yeah, yeah. yeah we had a lot of stuff going on internally that was crazy and yeah this just really built on that i i wonder how well this sort of holds up post 9 11 uh yeah. but i do remember watching this and just yeah this was a frightening uh film and yeah just aaron kruger did a great i think this was like maybe on the blacklist or something i remember hearing about this script sort of kicking around for a little while and then with with this cast at this time uh yeah these guys everybody's gonna show up see these guys in a movie and jeff bridges as such a you know sympathetic sort of every man guy you're gonna go along with and you are so manipulated by that evil tim robbins i hate tim robbins he's so evil in this one <laughs> it was like there was like the dark side to tim robbins in the late 90s because there was yeah. this and then uh bob roberts uh oh yep. yeah yep. yes but oh no that's that's yeah. a, a great yeah see i think this one's still a little bit lighter than than your other two i think we had to we had to turn the corner at the end a little bit so that it wasn't like well now i'm going off into this rest of my saturday in this yeah, kind exactly. of mood feel it everybody. yeah feel it yeah <laughs> So what's your last pick? <laughs> that was my, that was, I did three. I went first. And I did, oh, you went I first. went first. I mean, I can throw out things like, you know, The Strangers or The Mist or, you know, many other, you know, downer ending <laughs> movies. <laughs> well, but, but that's, but I, so I did, uh, why, why, what, so wait, you did Kids and Dancer in the Dark and The Graduate. Dancer in the Dark. Yes. That's, I'm typing along here yeah. and I missed that. Because you started singing along with the song and you just, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. I got, I, no, I blacked out <laughs> in the middle of that one. I, it's, I, yeah, it's not uh, in good space with Von Trier. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, the excellent set of films. Uh, I think, sure. For, if yeah. you're really yeah. in for a Ugh. hell of a weekend, yeah. just start with these. No, don't do that. Uh, that's perfect. <laughs> So that is that was to celebrate uh, uh, the Night of the Living Dead. Yes. Uh, which is the, the film that we opened with uh, at last week for our uh, Romero's Dead trilogy. And this week uh, we're um, we're moving to the mall uh, with uh, Dawn of the Dead. And so I opened the bidding with movies set in malls. That's a good starting point. Yes, it's been a, it's, excellent. It has been a while since I've seen this one. Uh, but oh, yeah, it's it was. So, a, what do you remember of it? Well, like, what uh, is what are the the key sort of uh, what sticks out? The mall. <laughs> okay, good. So we've started. We've got that. <laughs> and I did. I did see the 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 remake a, f a few years ago, and thought, yeah, that's you're you're doing some things in the mall. Um, mm -hmm. But is this the one with the? Uh, the different ending with the helicopter or something like that. I remember. Okay. So I vaguely remember that, but I, I do remember just throngs of, you know, the undead outside the mall. I don't remember a whole lot about the story is the issue other than okay. because I saw this when I think, yeah, I was in high school working in the video store and was like, I wanted to see all of the, like, you know, had seen Night of the Living Dead, had never seen Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead. And so I was like, I want to, I want to check out these sort of classic, uh zombie film so it's probably been 30 yeah. years since i've i've seen it uh because it's it was enjoyable it's not one that i'm like oh yeah i don't have a tradition of like watching this every halloween or every so often so i, I don't have as clear a memory this is the, the is this the military involved in this one or is that day of the dead i can't well, remember so so when this one opens um we have some members of the military who kind of get you know trapped into this makeshift we'll call it family okay uh, that we have these two soldiers and then the the helicopter re reporter the pilot who works for the 
TV station, the producer, and the four of them um, get sort of holed up in this mall and they kind of make it their own. Turns out she's pregnant. And uh, and so they be- they become kind of a, a makeshift family Okay, uh, as, as they seek to ride out the, the apocalypse. They clean up the mall. They have everything they possibly could need. And so it begins. Okay. Um, this is the one where at the end, the biker gang uh, also finds the mall and decides that they want to be a part of the mall. That's and, right. Too. And the looting begins, right? Okay. So you have this whole biker gang looting sequence. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so we could do something related to uh, stereotypical um, uses of biker, biker gang tropes, <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We, <laughs> right? we got to do something. Yeah. Got to get a little uh, on the fringe here because so get, that's what happens when you guys you... do a series like this. It's like, well, oh, yeah. zombie movies. No, can't do that. Uh, stereotypical yeah, yeah, yeah. biker groups. Yes. Oh, yeah. Stereotypical. Yeah. Stereotypes of biker games. Yes. All there right. we go. Oh, yeah. That's um, that's a whole series in itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. totally. Okay. Okay. Uh, movies set in malls, stereotype biker gang movies, and uh, what else do we have here? Um, uh, you know, again, we we're kind of holding off on the uh, anything related to zombies. Yeah. So far, uh, maybe we save that to the final film I, in I, our I, little trilogy. I think so here. yes, um, okay. I guess is this where. The government is trying to control a situation that they are completely unprepared for and things get out of hand. Right. So we're government failure to adequately respond to a disaster. I I don't think we we don't really have government okay. so much okay. in, in here. There is there is, you know, we get police and it the, the problem is like the military part is very brief okay. in the beginning. Okay. And the rest is just mall. Right. We're in the mall. Right. Okay. Uh, but you know what this movie is is about is uh, you know so much of this movie is about you know consumerism. consumerism right. That's yes. the the real story is about that sort of hedonic like drive to just be at the mall, and that's one that's one of the big messages is that these zombies, even after they are, uh, you know, dead, they still have uh, that they're just hardwired to come to the, to mall, to the mall because. Yeah the mall was so important to them. And that's, that's one of the big messages. So, um, you know, they've, you know, we could, is, is there something interesting around like movies about consumer culture? Oh, sure. Okay. So movies right. set in a mall, it's one thing, mm-hmm. but then about the larger, broader consumer culture. Sure. Uh, so there we go. Movies set in mall, biker gang movies and, uh, movies about consumer culture. There we are. All right, I like it. That's a good, good little trio. That'll be a fun uh, conversation to be had next week with Dawn of the Dead. That's it. Thanks, Steve. What a good, uh, what a good morning we've had here. What a fine Saturday matinee we have had together. <laughs> sure. And it. <laughs> you, still, no, I know it. I still. The I, mood is just the downers. <laughs> you want to talk about First Man? Any? No. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, I I will say I I am. You will be surprised. I am recommending it to people. I, yeah, high school students. No, but I. So I did also see Star is Born. So I am telling people see Star is Born, and I'm telling people you know check out First Man. I'm going to tell you it's you know it's this type of movie. It's it's historical. It's going to give you those things. But I think it is a movie that for me. Not what I was hoping for, but I still mm-hmm. think people should. I it's it merits more attention than I think it's getting. I think there will be an audience for this film. Apparently, you are one of them, uh, and and your family as well. <laughs> um, maybe it's just the three of you. I don't know. Damien Chazelle is like, I know my audience. It's they're up there in the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to make it's, this it's just the for rights. them. The rights they deserve this movie about Neil Armstrong. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Steve, because <laughs> even if you can say you should see First Man, I know people who like it. Like yeah. that is a review enough. <laughs> I I know three people that like it. Yes, <laughs> and I know th- oh, I, I know three is... others that really hated it or didn't enjoy it that much. So really hated no, it. No, I, I, I let's just say <laughs> there was some middle ground between you and me, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Just some middle ground. <laughs> 
Yeah, but anyway, there was yes. The vastness of space was the middle ground between us. <laughs> You're killing me. You are killing me. Thank you, uh, everybody, for downloading, listening to the show. We sure appreciate you listening to this because if you're listening to this, it means you are a direct supporter of the things we do at the next reel, uh, including Steve's misguided attempts to bring down the average for great movies. And with that, I'm going to stop recording and not let him get in the last word in spite of his efforts hondo 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 <laughs> hondo six star hondo i don't know. one star hondo i don't know.